Hello and welcome to the Great Song Adventure. My name is Paul Zolo and I'm here with my co-host Louise Goffin. Hi Paul. This is part two. We listened to part one last time. That's right. It was really great to talk to John Parrish. He's a producer, songwriter, interesting talk. And it's because you went all the way to England that we could do this. We're not just staying in one town, folks. We're, we're all around the world to bring you these interviews. And this was really great to talk to John Parrish. He's a producer, songwriter, interesting talk. Yeah, I really love talking about record production and always love talking about songs, but it's interesting to talk about what different people do with the songs once they get it. You know, one of the things he said about working with Polly Harvey is sometimes he would write tracks for her and give them to her and she would write lyrics over them. And he tells a funny story about how he realized whenever he gave her anything with an intro, she'd always start singing right away. She'd sing over the intro and make it part of the song. So a lot of times they kept that on the records, and he's learned that. But the other thing I like about the conversation, he talks about first takes. We've written together a lot, John and I, and what I love is that there's this sense of keeping things fresh, he seems to set up his productions in such a way that he is always capturing things before people know them too well and start overly editing themselves, which we all do. Yeah, you start to normalize everything. And But it was amazing to me to, to hear that, too, that she would start at what he thought was the intro before the verse really starts, and it would work, and he would go with that. That's what really songwriting is all about, that it's not what I intended, but that's good, so we'll do that. You follow it. Yeah, and in the, in the last episode, part one of this interview with John, he talks about the cross-pollinization that happened with, is that a word, pollinization? It sounds like, you know, colonizing or <laughs> pollinizing. He talks about how these different genres would meld together to create a new sound, like Massive Attack and Portishead. And, you know, really, we don't get as much of that here in the States because, yeah, I don't know, something happened with radio where they decided that you have an R&B act and you have mm-hmm. a pop act. And when people say, what kind of music do you do? It's always the worst question. How do you answer that question? Right. That, that is hard for musicians, but they want to put us in separate bins so they can market it easier. And if you, if you have too many kinds of music, they didn't want that. It's like, just do rock or just do folk cause it's easier to market. But musicians, we don't think about marketing as much as music, you know, just what sounds great. So I love that that's where this next part starts, that he's talking about how exciting it is back there in England that things would come together and no one would say that's wrong. They would, they yeah. would embrace it. Yes. Well, let's listen to that. Yeah. This is Louise in Bristol, England with John Parrish. It's getting very segregated musically in America. I mean, it's always been, because it's city you know, it depends on the cities, but mm. people yeah. are afraid. I, I notice that with the younger generation, they're afraid that they won't be taken seriously if they break out of the genre. Mm. They won't necessarily be associated as being credible in the genre that they like. Yeah. What do you, I mean, I know Bristol has its own flavor and music scene that no, you know, no other place has. And it's a very liberal, col- it's a college town and mm. the arts are... Big here. What do you think it is about here that has brought people together that way in the past, other than those three bands? Yeah, I, I mean, so it's, it, 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 it's hard to say, you know, because it because it you know once a city starts to develop that reputation, then people move to it because of that, and it reinforces it, uh, 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 and it, you know, and it develops. Along that along that line, I think it probably. I mean, obviously, as as you said, it's a college. There are two universities here, so you get a lot of students coming. So that's always a good thing for, um, you know, art and music and stuff and and uh, and, and ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's always happened. I think it's also it's um, it's it's much more affordable than London, but it's quite you know it's only an hour and a half to get to London here. So it's within. It, you don't feel very cut off. 
but it's um it's a place where, where you can live as an artist without having to work you know 18 hours a day whatever on some crap job in order to pay an astronomical rent mm -hmm. that is changing i have to say it's got much more expensive here than it was and i hope that it doesn't mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't tip over into that thing where, you know, artists are gradually sort of kicked out and have to find somewhere else. To go. At the moment, it's still, it's still OK, but, but I think you have to... Um, you, you actually, you know, the local authorities, the council, whatever, they have to actually be active in, in encouraging that, in, in stop, you know... We, we have that thing that you've got, you have in a lot of cities where, you know, there's been a venue, you know... For here for the last 40 years and some developer comes puts a block of luxury flats next to it people move in and complain about the noise and they shut the venue down you just, you know, and that's happening and you know that that's that doesn't have to happen you know you can just you know that's up to local councils to say this is part of this city people move to bristol because it's got a really well-known music scene or a really well-known art scene you know People come here as tourists because they want to see, you know, because Banksy was, you know, from here, and there's Banksy's all over the place, you know, like, and um, whatever. And you don't want to lose those things. You don't want to lose what makes the city special. But, but you know, obviously people come in with a huge amount of money, and it's very difficult for people to sort of say no to those kind of things. But you have to do it if you want to maintain, if you want to maintain that, because the see, you know, that's, I, I don't know when it started, you know, but, but, but certainly the, the early nineties, with a with massive massive attack, um, Tricky Porter said that was what made it known globally. And and ever since then, I'd say that there's been you know uh, it's been it's been taken very seriously as an artistic city, and that really helps because then it means you know kids growing up here they have a you know they have role models. They think oh yeah I could you know I could. I could, you know, Tricky, if Tricky hadn't been a star, you know, he'd, he'd have been in prison for the last 25 years. You know, he grew up on a really, really rough estate in Bristol. And, um, you know, by, you know, but he obviously had some amazing sort of talent that, you know, so that, that somebody teased out of him and he, and he escaped. But other people on, you know, that come from that estate will, will see that and think, oh, he did it. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not, you know, I, I'm not, you know, there's always going to be kids in those places, you know, that feel like, you know, in a quite hopeless situation that really could do something great, but they need to see, they need to see a way, they need to see that it's possible. And um, that's, that's important. Yeah. Hope is mm. the important thing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, that's, it's beautiful. I didn't know Banksy was from here. Now I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. when I get in the car, I'm going to be looking around and saying, yeah. where's the, you know, where's the evidence? Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, so how did you meet Polly and how did that start? I mean, you, you worked with her when she was starting, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, well, she was, um, she was basically, basically from the same town as me, same small town, the mm -hmm. or surrounding area. And, um, and when she was, you know, a teenager, like 17 or so, I guess, um, she would come and see shows of my first band. Mm -hmm. that I had with um, with Rob Ellis and, and a couple of other friends and mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah she'd come to concerts and uh, and then after one or you know after a couple she started giving me cassettes of songs that she'd written and, and I was like wow she's got you know she's got a really good voice you know they were quite naive songs you know she was you know, just she was kind of playing in a folk duo, her and a penny whistle play. You know, <laughs> it was kind of folky stuff and uh, very different from yeah, her image yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you you you'd never you'd never guess, but the voice was already there, even as a seventeen-year-old singing these kind of kind of funny folk songs. Mm -hmm. There was something like fantastic about her voice, and I immediately thought, "Oh, she sounds really good. I'm going to see if she'll." Um, See if she'll join my band. <laughs> so, so I just said, you know, when she, when you leave school next year, you know, do you want to join join the band? So she's like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So, um, so she joined the band and was in Automatic Lamini for for the next three years until basically until she formed the PJ Harvey Trio. What was the name of your band? The Automatic Automatic Lamini. It's like an impossible, yeah, an impossible to pronounce. It's, you know, one of those. I don't, I don't know why we picked a name. What does like it that. mean? It was, it's a surname, it's an African surname mm -hmm. from Swaziland. It's a very, very common name, actually. If you ever read any news article about anything going on in Swaziland, 
I can guarantee somebody will be called somebody Glamini. And that was the thing. And, autom and a friend of mine was working out there as a soil scientist when he was a student. And um, and he came back one day and said, oh, you never guess I've got, you know, a new guy working for me, a local guy. And you never guess what his name is. He said, what? He said automatic Lamini. <laughs> he said, well, that, that's crazy. Yeah, these like a lot of the people they, they want to have, they wanted, to, they're looking for English names to give their kids. And, the, you know, they'll just read a name off anything. They, you know, like Hoover, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and so automatic was a totally, seemed like a totally reasonable name. We thought it was a funny story. So we used it as the name of the band and then spent the next 10 years trying to get people to remember what the name of the band was, which was impossible. It was a terrible idea, but, you know. That's fun. Mm. So you told me that you have a record coming out. You have a couple of singles out from it. Mm. Yeah, tell me what that's okay. about. The, the, so there's a new album coming out um, on the Thrill Jockey label, label from Chicago that's been putting out my records for the last 15 years or whatever, when, whenever I manage to get it together to, to get one to them, which isn't as often as I would like. But, um, so there's a new one coming out, it's called Bird Dog Dante. Mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's When I started the record, I, I really had in mind I wanted to do it uh, and I still see, you know, because I'm very old school, I think of albums as vinyl records. So I mm -hmm. think of it as two sides. It was going to be one side songs, one side instrumental. That's how I wanted it to be. But as uh, the more, as kind of writing progressed, I realised it was slightly leaning a bit more heavily towards songs and ended up being about two thirds songs, one third instrumental. Uh, and it didn't seem to sit like side by side. So I ended up kind of mixing them up a bit to, in order to, to make it run in a way that sort of, worked for me but I ended up being really happy with it or as happy as you can ever be with your own work you know it's one of those things you do your own work and in a way it's for other people to be happy to, to like it I think it's very hard to, to like your own work until you go back to it 10 years later and you think oh that was, that was great that one you know I didn't really That's notice it at the time uh, and something else that you really loved right then you think that's oh, okay but you know it didn't stay with me for whatever but, but you know you, you, you do it and, and I have to be the only way I, I can finish a record is because um, you know I'm ter you know I do I have all the bad habits that I tell people not to do when I'm producing I have myself so can't tell myself not to do it but the only thing I can do is is say okay I'll so I'll spend you know ages sort of working on songs you know or I'll start, I'll record the music for something and six months later I'll go back to it and think oh yeah, I'll, I'll put a guitar on that you know and it takes me forever to get something done but for the mixing what I, what I do is I just say okay two weeks in the studio, hiring a studio, hiring an engineer to come over from Italy, this, this guy that I normally work with. So I'm forced to mix the whole thing in that time and we don't go back to it. And that, that's really for me the only way I can I, I can do it. Otherwise I know I'll just fiddle around forever and think, oh, no, it's not quite done. It's not, you know, and, 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 and then after a while you just, the thing loses a shape because a, a good album has to have a shape mm -hmm. and it has to have something that pulls it together especially you know, if you're mixing up songs and instrumentals you know it's not very you know it's not you know there's no lyrical concept to the record as such but uh, but for me it's really important if you're putting an album out that it has to hang together as a record i know you know people say oh but you know people listen to on spotify they listen to one song it, uh, but that's fine if they want to listen i can't control how you listen to it but i can control how it goes out so if you want to listen to it as a whole album it's going to work like that that that's great. Have you ever been bothered by something that you didn't fix, and then went back to it later and thought, "I should have listened to myself." It still bothers me now. That's a good question. Have I ever done that? Um, I don't think so. No, there are certainly things that I've done that bother me when I hear them now. But I, at the time, they didn't bother me. I didn't think of it as a mistake. They're just things that, you know, a lot of it's like lyrics that I wrote when I was young, you know, that now I, I can't, I don't relate to. And, yeah. and I think in some ways I'm kind of almost old enough that I can look back on myself at 22, 23 as a totally different person mm -hmm. and accept, accept it for what it was. Whereas... I'm not quite there yet. I still, I still feel like, like, slightly embarrassed by, by it. Whereas, I, I think in an, ask me that question in five years, and I, and I, and I, I think I'll, I'll be. That's okay. That was me at twenty-two. That's what I thought. 
don't yeah. think that now, and I can totally separate the two. Yeah, I get that. I mean, I have sometimes I'll look back for years. I was embarrassed, and now I'll look back and I'll have an endearing. Yeah. Oh, it's endearing. Yeah. You know my naivete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's a good thing to think about because there's sometimes I've learned to if something bothers me, I've learned to trust myself because I often go back and think the exact thought later. I go, that bothered me then, and I didn't do anything about it, and somebody talked me out of it or said it's going to be okay, and mm. it it still bothers me now, and and you know for the most part I try to listen to those things, but there there is a expiration date where you can't keep fixing you, you can't no you have to say it's done it's mm. imperfect yeah i wish i sung a line there instead of ooh, ooh yeah but, you mm. know you just but, let but, it but, but that's what, what it is. yeah you, you you have to i i think that you can't i mean i you know spent a lot of time when i started making records re-recording stuff you know yeah. thinking this song is great i just haven't got the right recording of it and i you know everything was great apart from that bit so you go back and record it again change the bit that you didn't like and that bit was really good but the rest of it now it doesn't sound right it's, because and, it's a balance and yeah it took me a long time to figure you can't there's no you can't make the perfect recording of the song on purpose you can only do that by accident sometimes you can go back and you think that is phenomenal that recording i never knew it at the time i didn't think you know i thought it was i, I might have quite liked it but i never thought that i was going to look back on it 10 15 years later and think that is great. There's nothing wrong with that recording. Uh, uh, but you can't see that at the time. It's, but but you do learn, the more records you do, I, I've really learned to trust my instinct on things, OK? That this feels right. And it go, it's going back to that thing like, do you buy it? You know, do you believe it? Mm -hmm. And if you believe it, it can have mistakes. It can have things that you know are imperfect mm -hmm. on it. But if but you believed it, and that, and that's OK. That's the, that's the important thing. And those are the songs that will... That will stay with you, that you'll be able to go back and think, yeah, okay, that, you know, whatever you might you might have a niggly line. I mean, there 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 will be things like that. And I did try and I was quite on this new album. I was quite. Um, I thought I don't want to be in a position where where I've got lines that that I'm going to go back to and think I wish I hadn't done that. And I and I did one of the songs in the album, the duet with Polly, and um, it was about a friend of ours that died a few years ago and um because he was a really good friend with the three of us were close and so i really wanted polly to sing it and um uh, with me it felt really what's the important. name of that song it's called sorry for your loss mm -hmm. and um uh, when polly came to sing it she said uh, you know i love love the lyrics fantastic but there's this line there were two lines she picked out and said you know one line she just said oh that just sounds like you use that line because it's because it seems like the obvious line to go after that line. And this line, she said, I'm just not sure that that's saying what you mean it to say. You know, do you think you could come up with something different? I was like, oh, okay. So I, well, so I sweated, yeah. I love that she's doing that. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. So I, you know, I, I, so I rewrote those two lines and they were much better. And I was so much happier with them. And so I thought, mm, okay, that was really good. So I then, <laughs> then said, hey, do you mind if I send you all the songs? Just go through the lyrics. Just, um, you know, pick out lines, you know, if there's anything like anything like that, just like you did there, if there's anything you think is a lazy line or you don't know why it's there or it seems to not make sense in the thing, just tell me. She was brilliant like that. So it was, it was, it was great, you know, to have that help. Sometimes, you know, some, a, a lot of the things I changed because of that. Some things I didn't because I thought, OK, I understand why you don't like that, but for me that's... That's and this right isn't thing. a collaborative record. This is your record. This is and my you're record. Asking yeah. her as a respected peer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As a peer and a friend, yeah. uh, and you know, somebody who writes great lyrics. So I knew, you know, to take some very serious and thinks very, very hard about them. So I knew she would go through it with that kind of fine attention to detail, and she'd see things, that, you know, so that you can't see in your own work. And it was, um, it, and it was great because you know, I'm. You know, classic producer, very, very bad at letting my own thing. You know, letting somebody else produce me, and really, really bad at it. And mm. and and and, and, I, and I think that's a that's a big a big fault. And mm. and I'm sure my records would be better if I got somebody else in to produce them. <laughs> but I I just I'm you know I still can't quite do this. So that was almost like me dipping my toe in that water. Okay, you, go on, you be you you because you know she did. Uh, 
basically she, that's exactly what I do when she writes words for for now you know she'll send me the words when she comes through and says do the same thing you know tell me if there's any that's not working and uh, and it was just really nice to think oh actually you know you could you could do that for me on this one that would be um, that would be great and it was you know really uh, really grateful for it that's a great thing with collaboration as well and and you know I think even for songwriters up and coming it's great to have a community of some kind, you know, mm. people that you can play things for. I mean, mm. we used to call it song doctoring, you know. Yeah, I, good, good description of it. Yeah, yeah. you mm. come over to someone whose house you respect and you say, let me play you this song. And I, and I have people I have gone to and mm. they have always made the song better. So you mm. know that line, you don't actually need it there. Yeah. Or the thing that I most often would hear is, I kept writing mm. and people would say no you don't need more yeah. just repeat that good bit you have and yeah. it never occurred to me that if you have a good bit repeating it mm. is a very powerful thing rather yeah. than just writing more mm. it's it's great that you did that and that she was able to offer yeah no i mean you. you know she's always been there for you know to to listen to stuff i mean we've always been there for each other you know that we've been friends and worked together for more than 30 years now so you know so we know each other so well we're, we're really uh, um, the, you know the, the any kind of you know tiptoeing around the subject that's gone you know years ago we can be brutally honest with each other and and, and it's and it's great and we also understand how each other thinks about things so that we know that there are points where our tastes don't necessarily cross and so so we might not like the same thing but uh, but but our reaction to it, we we understand how it works, and and we can still tell whether it's you know whether it's any good or not. Even you know I can hear things in a track that Polly might write that might not be one of my favourite things, but I can I can say what you know, and she might really like it for whatever reason. I'll still be a, a good critic critic for it because she knows how I think about things, and she and she'll understand why it's not working for me and whether that's a problem whether that's my problem or whether it's a problem with the song you know because sometimes you don't know that do you if you've got because you can play stuff to people and they'll say something else something's not working but you're not quite sure sometimes unless you know them really well you don't know whether is that just a taste it's a thing? Yeah, thing or, yeah or is it is it is it a is it an actual problem with it with the song am i going to stand my ground on this yeah one because yeah I, yeah you've thought about it yeah that's great you know i just want to go back to where we were at the beginning of the conversation talking about the castle because the castle was such a transformative thing for so many people I mean you later came to stay in Laurel Canyon and that was transformative and you mentioned earlier that the way you collaborate was also educational and inspiring when you had to get thrown in with people but so much has happened in a lot of people's lives because of attending that castle mm. I mean I'm about you're about to drive me to Chris Difford's songwriting retreat, <laughs> 45 minutes away from here. <laughs> you're my, you're my driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, today, I'm your, welcome, welcome. Yeah, I, I'm your Uber a, driver you, today. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. volunteered to be my <laughs> chauffeur two, yeah. two years in a row. Chris Difford did that 25, 26 years ago and was like, hang on, this is a great idea. I'm going to do this. And I, I know that those castle retreats that Miles Copeland did, they went for a while and they morphed into other things. And, and now I know Greg Wells mm -hmm. does them in some other think tank capacity. And it's really become a thing now mm -hmm. for people to go off somewhere. You're in a place where there's no outside interference. You know, yeah. it, it's just a hothouse of creativity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, it, a lot of people have gone off and changed their creative directions just as a result of being at one of those things uh, there's some, there's something great i mean i i had the, the, you know that reaction i was nervous about going i just thought oh i don't know about this you know then i was kind of i was excited on one level as well because i knew it was a challenge and i liked you know i i do like to be put in situations where i can't you know just retreat to my comfort zone you know yeah. and, and i knew it would would be a would be I I hoped it would be an interesting thing, which it, which it was. It was mm -hmm. But I had I did, really had no idea that that I would be able to come up with that many 
that many songs or that many ideas for songs, you know, mm-hmm. with, with that kind of reg- regularity. I did find, you know, I remember the first day was the hardest for me by a long way, even though I was writing with Pat, who also became Pat a really McDonald's. good friend. Yeah. Great writer. And he and he went off and did his own, yeah. mm. which he's doing three times a year in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, his right. hometown. And he thought, okay, I've been doing this castle thing with Miles. And, you know, so... Just the background is Pat McDonald, who was in Timbuk 3, and from Sturgeon Bay, said, all right, I'm going to do one of these things. And, mm. you know, every year would have people come and stay in the hotel rooms and put recording studios in some of the rooms. And yeah. in Pat's case, he played Spin the Bottle yeah. in the parking lot. And you'd spin a bottle, <laughs> an old Jack Daniels bottle, and the next two people that it would land on would be your writing right. partner. But it's it is. <laughs> That's great. It's quite transformative, and mm. you know, I did write. I don't know if we started something there, but there were lots of songs. I'm sure we did. We we definitely did. I can't remember what it was called, but we 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 absolutely Amelia did. Amelia Earhart was later. Was it? That was that we did that one in um in Laurel Canyon when I was in Laurel like Canyon. Like Amelia Earhart. Yeah. And I never recorded it quite the way. Again, it's that demo thing. I don't think I ever recorded it the way I played it. And I, and I remember going to someone's house like four years ago and playing it on the piano. And they were in the other room. They went, what's that? You know, right. loving it immediately. Mm. And I had my DreamWorks deal. Right. And did it, just overdid it. Yeah. It didn't end up yeah. on the record. Mm. I remember taking your gorgeous slide guitar from another demo and right. flying it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be one worth just putting up a mic and, you know. Yeah, it's great. I, I've, and, I've done it live. Have you? Yeah, I've done it oh, live. Oh, I'd love to yeah. hear that. Mm. And then Blinker the Star, you wrote with him mm. on that record. Yeah. yeah, no, there's some there's some great, there's some great songs. It's a, he was a great writer. I, that, great that, writer. That, that That's a shame that that, that that didn't do, that that should have done, a, that should have done really well. I still well, love that record, that record mm. whenever I put it on. <laughs> but there was so much talent and, you know, in that era, in the late 90s, we'd all look at everything as disposable, take to a record company, get a deal, and have something else done with those songs, and a lot of them sat on cassettes and dats. Mm. But now, going back, a lot of those recordings that we made on site yeah. are great. I bet they're really... I bet they're really I'm sure I've got a dat of the of the stuff from the castle somewhere. I definitely took one away with me. Yeah, we all did. Yeah. <laughs> Which bag are they in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and does your dat machine still work? You know, I, I, had, to, I had to buy another one down there because I, 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 I was looking for something that was, I needed to get something off a of dat tape earlier on this year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I had, you know, the dat tape that I'd always used, which was over there, put the tape in it, just chewed it up immediately. It didn't work. So, that's, oh, okay. that's, uh Took the worst. It, yeah, took it. To, managed to get somebody to to get it out. So at least yeah. I had the tape back. And then, um, you know, I, I sort of asked various friends in studios around. You know, if you if you still got that machine, everyone said yes. <laughs> and, and so I said, have you used it recently? They're like, no, but I think it still works. None of them worked. Mm. Not one in any of the studios that I went to. And uh, and then I bought one off eBay that was supposed to be working. That didn't work. And then eventually, like, I, I got this from a, t- a TV company. It was you know one of those really high quality professional ones that were you know god knows how many thousands of pounds it looks fancy out. yeah it's great and, and and it plays so it's fantastic it's is it great. one that you burn a cd from or no? no you can't yeah. you can't burn a cd but it's got you know it's got time code all kinds of things i'm never going to need yeah and, but, and what is a cd anyway what's that <laughs> yeah they're gonna they're gonna be gone aren't they they're, yeah they're, 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 yeah well the thing about having something you can hold i that's something i cherish i mean there's, it's just not the same. You can't hold a digital. No, it's not. But, but it sounds different, but you can't hold it either. You know, there's no. a two two strikes against yeah. them. You know? I mean, that's why records are still, you know, still around. You know, that's why people, you know, fans still buy records because it's it's a really nice thing to have, and you know, and you you, and you know, you're going to be able to play it. You know, for the for the rest of your life, that 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 that, that kind of thing is not going to change. You know that that technology. Or I know I know there'll be records. You know, long after I'm gone, for sure. Yeah, it's 
it's a beautiful thing to be able to see artwork and mm. read yeah. the credits. Yeah, it, it feels like a, like if you're a fan, you know, because I see that with the with the with the girls, you know, they listen to stuff off Spotify, of course, like everybody. But if they as soon as they like something, they're down the record shop and they'll buy a vinyl copy of it because they want to have the thing. Do they have a vinyl player? Yeah, they both. Yeah, yeah. yeah and even if you them. didn't. You can still look at the yeah, thing while I, you're listening on Spotify. Absolutely, they do. Or, you know, yeah. and most records come with a download code as well, can't you? So you could do a legal, sort of good quality download as well if you want to do that. And I don't think people even download anymore. I, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. It's more streaming, but yeah. I, I could be wrong. But mm. but it, it comes down to the music in the end. It's all down to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having a chat. Pleasure. Absolute and pleasure. Now we're going to drive to uh, Pinard House. Yeah, and you're going to write another five, six songs in, in the next week, right? <laughs> well, yeah, at least. Well, yeah, I'll probably come back with four. Right, okay. Five, maybe. You know, what? what's more valuable is, you know, the people that you stay in contact with, just in yeah. the same way that we've known that, each other that, all that, is the, that, for me, that's the, you know... Uh, it was those were the two the two great things I took from that you know that week in in France was yeah making really good friends that I've stayed in contact with, and um, a, and it was that kick about being able to just 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 write when you you don't have to have the idea before you start sometimes you just just start mm -hmm. and, and have confidence that something will will happen and and it might be really good you know and. And, and that's that's brilliant for me, certainly when I'm writing film music, because sometimes it just, you know, you go and you've got no idea. So I literally just think, OK, I've got a week. I need to come up with something for a couple of scenes because I've said I'm going to deliver something at the end of this week. I've got to do it. Mm -hmm. And so and I'm now confident that I can do it. I know that something will happen. So it might take might take half an hour. It might take three days before the first really good idea comes. But at some point, if I'm just tinkering something will like, ah, that's a nice chord, or that's the, the, that combination of notes is good, or that combination of, so that's, uh, and then, then you're off. And that is, but you need, you, need, you need to have the confidence to just throw yourself in. That's an inspiring thing. All right. Well, thank you. Pleasure, Louise. All right. <laughs> that was Louise with John Parrish, recorded in Bristol in uh, June, just a few months ago, June of 2018. That was a great talk. You're listening to The Great Song Adventure with Louise Goffin and Paul Zolo. And, you know, you can find us on iTunes, but you could also go directly to our website, which is thegreatsongadventure.com, and there's a lot of photos and stories about stuff we're doing. We do, uh, we do labor and toil to put these episodes together for you, and we care. We do care. And we, we go all the way to England to get them. <laughs> and, in fact, our next episode is also from England, though I recorded it on the phone from America, but with Chrissy Hine, one of our archival in interviews coming next. Chrissy! Chrissy Hine. Pretender. I love that talk so much. It's the best. She's pretty great, Chrissy Hine. So we're going to hear that next. And uh... Meanwhile, you can be following us and find out all these great episodes as they come out if you go to Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram also, as well. Yes, I was not going to forget Instagram. And you can follow our Spotify playlist, The Great Song Adventure. 